Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in our Talks with Walt as we are calling our readings through the deathbed edition of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. We turn now to the little poem, Old Chance, C-H-A-N-T-S. Of course, this does spell sound like the other chance, as in give me a chance. And I find that when Whitman plays these types of games, I love this, Old Chance. This is poem 16 of the 31 of Goodbye My Fancy. So here we are now at the very middle of the second annex. And I love this poem because it, in the end, tells us what Whitman believes is the greatest contributions that need to uh, be uh, um, said out loud for Leaves of Grass. In other words, we're going to get this amazing list of where did he get all these ideas sometimes it's been asked. He's going to tell us now at the very end of, uh, of the poems that are collected as Leaves of Grass. Now our assumptions are that you've been uh, following us at LearnStrong.net down that left-hand side, Talks with Walt, our playlist, and that you are a part of our introductory set of comments to uh, the second annex, uh, um, Goodbye My Fancy. Now our Nortons, as we are referencing it, will tell us that this poem was first published in the New York Truth March 19th, 1891, um, and uh, the, uh, there was an alternate title, uh, Ancient Song Reciting. Now, I love this, uh, the, the cataloging of this poem, and I love the fact that the word old is continuing to be used. Um, you'll remember the uh, To the Old Cause, this is poem number six at the very beginning of Leaves of Grass, as I pondered in silence, old land, so here we are with Old chance, old uh, gets used. Think about it, eight times in Annex Two. Old gets used, so obviously it's a collection of poems about the old. And then he'll go to it, an ancient song. Later, it's going to be ancient poet, an ancient song. Notice it's song, not songs. Reciting, ending, once gazing toward thee, mother of all. This makes nine times that mother of all phrase has been used. Musing, we're going to get a lot of that at the end of Leaves of Grass. Seeking themes fitted for thee. So it's almost as if now he, I think he's channeling his Dante here. And you'll remember, of course, that uh, Dante will, will uh, take that trip into limbo where all of those great writers, poets are. And, of course, he hopes someday to be included. I think there's a lot of Dante in this poem. Notice he'll say, with, uh, with the use of italics here, Except for me, thou sayest, the elder ballads, and name for me before thou goest each ancient poet. Now, the fact that he uses the word ballads takes us obviously to Wordsworth's lyrical ballads of 1800, 1801, 1802. And we've talked about that at LearnStrong.net. I think some of that is in Whitman's mind. And then he'll talk about his debts in parenthetics. Of many debts incalculable, happily our New World's chiefest debt is to old poems, end quote. Now, I find this fascinating because how much of Leaves of Grass have we been hearing about the need to depart and leave these ancient or these old poems? But now, in a text called Leaves of Grass, he's going to talk about the growing motif, and he's going to talk about where all of his stuff came from. And now he's going to give us this amazing catalog, ever so far back, precluding the America. Now, eight times in Annex 2, America will get used. Of course, we're going to have America uh, being mentioned 92 times in Leaser Grass, as we said. But any time that he mentions America, we always kind of sit up and pay attention. Now, <clears throat> where did all of his poems come from? Watch this list. Old Chants, right? Um, you'll remember this from Music uh, of the Storm 4. Old Chants. Um, as, as he gets in the music of the storm, all that listing, right? Old chance, Egyptian priests. We know Egyptology is very important for Whitman. E Egyptian priests, those of Ethiopia, his celebration, obviously, of Africa. The Hindu epics, remember? Again, Prime Music of Storm 4. The Hindu epics, and now he's referencing the Upanishadic texts, the Bhagavad Gita and other texts. The Grecian, Chinese, Persian, the great inclusivist. Uh, and to me, this is what makes Whitman such an amazing international poet. I mean, let's take us back to Passage to India in our comments and, and elsewhere as well. The Biblic books, we know that the biblical cadences have been all the way ubiquitous through this. The Biblic books and prophets and deep idols of the Nazarene. You know, takes us, by the way, Nazarene gets used only one time in Leaves of Grass. It's here, obviously, to him that was crucified. 
comes immediately to mind. His pay, his the debt he owes to to the the Christian uh, religion, and of course to the Bible, and of course to Judaism, and of course to Christ Himself. And then first times only times mentioned in all these of grass: the Elian, Odyssey, plots, doings, wanderings of Aeneas. Notice his spelling uh, minus the a. Um, all of these are only used one time in Lisa Grass, and it's right here at the end. Hishad, of course, the great poet. Aeschylus, Sophocles, the great dramaticist. We've given full lectures on so many of these writers, haven't we, at LearnStrong.net. Merlin, Arthur. It's interesting that he mentions Merlin, because Merlin, of course, is more a character than a, than a writer, and then obviously with the, the Arthurian motif. The Cid, as in the great Spanish poem. Roland, as in, of course, the great, uh, the great French um, um, poet, uh, poem. Ro uh, Roland at uh, Ronsalvin. Uh, and then the, uh, the Nebulene, he'll, he'll, he, um, he's going to give us the, the, great, the great poets and the great poems of Europe. The troubadours, minstrels, menacingers, scolds. We think even of our Beowulf here, don't we, with the scops. He'll mention Chaucer one time in Leaves of Grass. It's right here. Chaucer, Dante. Now, Dante does get mentioned in Song of Exposition and to get the final lilt of songs uh, in Annex number one. Dante, I, I said to you guys, I think Dante is one of the most important poets for, uh, for Whitman. Flocks of singing birds is the way that he will call it. I love that he will call these great, great writers that. Flocks of singing birds. The border minstrelly, the bygone ballads. We're back to ballads again. Feudal tales. Essays, plays, and then he'll mention Shakespeare, Schiller, Walter Scott. These are, of course, contemporaries. Tennyson, which, again, takes us back to the final lilt of songs in the first Annex collection. And then he'll use an interesting simile here. As some vast, wondrous, weird dream presences. Now, go back to Song of the Answer 2 for this use of this word weird. And dream presences makes us immediately think of sleepers. The great shadowy groups gathering around. And again, this takes us to Inferno 4 and, and how Dante stumbles into limbo and then he sees all these amazing poets. Of course, for him, it's Homer. Notice, Homer is not mentioned in this poem, but the Iliad and the Odyssey are, right? Uh, the great shadowy groups gathering around, darting their mighty, masterful eyes forward at thee. So, I mean, this is really, he's just channeling Dante. I think his, his hope is that when he dies, he will be met by all these amazing poets who will welcome him into their community, their shadowy group, right? Darting their mighty masterful eyes to walk forward at thee, and then he'll use thou twice, exclamation point, thou, with his now thy bending neck and head, obviously, he's, he's getting older, with courteous hand and word, ascending. Think about the power of Dante's Divine Comedy. I mean, we've given full lectures on all of that at Learn Strong if you want to run that to ground. Thou, Pausing a moment, drooping thine eye upon them, blent with their music. So there it is. The idea of, again, back to proud music of the storm. That somehow leaves a grass and now becomes part of the greatest heritage. And, you know, somewhere, Harold Bloom is now smiling as he says, told you so, one more time. I mean, it's all right here. Whitman wanted to be a part of the greatest ones, right? Of the greatest ones. Blent with their music, well pleased, accepting all. And then his use of this word curiously, I mean, go all the way back to our, our very early um, comments about how Whitman is this amazing, curious poet, writer, artist, curiously prepared for by them. And I, and I think he's channeling as well Marcus Aurelius's Meditations. You'll remember in Meditations, we've given lectures at Learnstrong about this, but do you remember the opening lines of Meditations where Aurelius asks, who made me what I am? Let me play that game out. Oh, I know. It was all these people who starts listening. I think the same is being said here. Prepared for by them, thou enterest at thy entrance porch. I mean, you can kind of think of this as his view of heaven. His view of heaven is Dante's limbo, where all these amazing writers sit and prepare to say hello to Walt Whitman himself. Which takes us, I think, now to 2A and messages. Great artists always hope that they will be welcomed by other great artists. It's, 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 I think it's really an important um, observation here. At 2B, I love the amazing list in the catalog. And again, the only mention of the Iliad and the Odyssey and of Aeneas is right here in this poem. At 3A, well, I mean, obviously, all of the great poems. I mean, think about all of those great writers that we study, and especially Dante. 
and the, uh, to get the final lilt of songs in Annex 1. I think he's playing around with this game. Who will meet me on the other side if I need anyone? And he says, man, I hope it's Dante. You know? And finally, 3B, who do you hope meets you at your entrance porch? And do you hope to be met by any greats? And I'm hopeful that our talks with Walt will have put you a little bit closer to at least one of those greats, Walt Whitman. Thank you.